Welcome to the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast. Are you ready to unlock the full potential and growth in your business? You've already crossed seven figures in sales, but the challenge is knowing how to take your business to the next level. Join Josh Hadley, an eight-figure e-com business owner and investor, as he interviews highly successful business owners. Get ready, because you're going to learn specific actions you can take today to help your business reach its full potential and leave a lasting impact on the world. Hi, Josh Hadley here, host of the Ecom Breakthrough Podcast, where I interview the top business leaders in e-commerce. This episode is brought to you by Ecom Breakthrough Consulting where I help seven figure companies grow to eight figures and beyond. I started Hadley Designs in 2015 and grew it to an eight figure brand in seven years. I made a lot of mistakes along the way. We'll be talking a lot about those today. Um, but along that path to eight figures, I made a lot of mistakes and at times I doubted whether our business could even survive and actually become a real brand. I wish I would have had a guide to help me grow faster and overcome those easy stumbling blocks that I encountered. If you've hit a plateau and you want to know the next steps to take your business to the next level, then go to ecombreakthrough.com. That's ecom with two M's to learn more. And as a special bonus to my podcast listeners, this month I'm giving away one $10,000 comprehensive business strategy audit session at no cost. Email me at josh at ecombreakthrough.com with the subject line strategy audit and tell me why your business should win the free strategy audit for the chance to win. And don't worry if you don't win the free strategy audit this month, because you'll automatically be entered for future months. Today, I am excited. I have Chad Franson here of Rise25, who has done hundreds of interviews with successful entrepreneurs and CEOs. We have flipped the script and he will be interviewing me today. Hey, Josh, thanks so much. It's great to be here. Hey, uh, in our last episode, uh, I spoke to you about some of the amazing success that you've had with Hadley Design. But as you mentioned, you uh, you also made some mistakes kind of along the way. And I thought it would be interesting to kind of get into those so people who are listening maybe can learn from your mistakes to prevent them from uh, making them in the future. Why don't you give me some maybe a broad view of some of the um, maybe primary mistakes that you feel like you made, and then we can kind of dive into them. Yeah, that I think... Uh this episode could go on for hours and hours, maybe even days and days in terms of mistakes that I've made and failures along the way. Like I mentioned, kind of in the introduction, you know, my path to eight figures was not just an easy walk in the park, so to speak. Um, it definitely came with a lot of challenges. And genuinely, there were times where I really doubted myself and could I actually grow a real brand? Could I actually run a successful business? And so let's, let's dive into some of these. I'll kind of give you a high level overview of what, you know, kind of the top level mistakes that I want to share with the audience, because ultimately my goal is that for everybody listening, you're able to avoid these mistakes that I made and help you move faster in your own um, journey as an entrepreneur. So let's talk about mistake number one is thinking that I have to be diversified in every sales channel possibly, or possible out there. Okay. Number two is going to be hiring people without having like clearly defined roles and probably hiring people to just solve a problem without me actually understanding the problem and very clearly defining that role. Number three is going to be waiting too long to document the processes in my business. And then number four is hiring, um, trying to hire people at the cheapest rate possible. And then number five is launching or creating me too products that aren't 100% original or unique. So those are going to be like the five big mistakes that I'd love to share with the audience today. Chad, where would you like to start? Yeah. You know, when I hear you list those mistakes, I think like, I think most people would probably think along the same lines uh, that you were thinking maybe when you first started making those mistakes. So I think it'll be very, uh, interesting and informative to hear some kind of your journey regarding these mistakes. Why don't we start with the first one, having you felt like you had to diversify the business and communicate through all channels. Tell me um, maybe what your thought process was going in and why that seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll rewind the script here back to 2017 when we first, you know, really dove into Amazon as our primary sales channel for Hadley designs, you know, at the time, in 2017, it was still somewhat of the wild, wild west of Amazon. And there were a lot of people preaching that, hey, Amazon can suspend your account at any time. 
And during the year of 2017, we actually, you know, hit seven figures our first year on Amazon. So it was exciting, but at the same time, it was like, wow, we've built a, you know, decent sized business in just one year. Well, now let's go diversify, right? Because I just continue to hear people talk about, well, go build your own Shopify site because you don't want to wake up one day and Amazon suspended your account. So really this came from a place of fear for myself. It was like, oh, okay, like let, let's go start trying to pursue other opportunities. Let's not keep, you know, feeding the Amazon beast. Rather, let's kind of run away and see if we can generate the same amount of revenue elsewhere. And obviously that is much easier said than done. Um, so what we ended up doing because we, you know, we genuinely spent three years trying to diversify ourselves off of Amazon. And I would say that was probably one of my biggest mistakes because if we just would have doubled down on Amazon and just been like, we're all in on Amazon, we're not doing anything shady. We're not using black hat tactics. We're not using gray hat tactics. Everything's white hat. So really at the end of the day, like we didn't need to be scared of anything. And to this day, like we've, our account's been just fine. So that's why I say like, if I could rewind the tapes and go back to 2017, I would tell myself like, if you've already hit success in a particular sales channel and you know there's more room to grow, go and double down on that sales channel. I would argue that Hadley Designs could be two or three times bigger than it is today had we just doubled down on Amazon rather than what we did do, and I'll share that with you, is try to diversify our sales channels. So with Amazon, we were selling physical products, right? And we had this great idea that's like, hey, let's diversify ourselves. Let's go create a Shopify site. And then, hey, there's also this good opportunity on, on Etsy where people are selling these digital files. And so we had this genius idea at the time that was like, okay, so many people talk about how, you know, physical products, uh, brands, you know, so much cap gets tied up in inventory that cash flow becomes a problem. So yeah, I think it would be great if we did just digital products. Let's go dominate that on Etsy. And then let's open up our own Shopify site. We can maybe sell some of our physical products there, but let's really sell these digital products. And again, we did this all out of fear and running away from Amazon, which was, which was working great for us. So we end up going in and we spend, literally we spent the last, those next three years from 2017 until 2020, we spent building out our, our Shopify site, which honestly, like, I think the best day we had was like maybe like one or $200, which is just like laughable. Um, as we looked at Amazon, we're making, you know, thousands of dollars a day there. Um, so we spent three years working on Shopify. Then we're like, oh, we just need to figure out this external traffic thing and, and drive more traffic to our own Shopify site. So then we build a blog and I have no experience building a blog. So we spent an entire year working on a blog hiring people for this blog that's making no money and for this website, our Shopify site, that's making absolutely no money for us. And we just continue to double down in the wrong place. All of our time and energy is focused on Shopify, building a blog, growing our Instagram account so that we can feed traffic. We believed our problem was just that we weren't getting enough traffic. And man, we just spent thousands of dollars, thousands of hours um, with our not only Becca and I, but our entire team trying to build this thing that really never took, got off the ground. Uh, but Amazon continued to churn out more and more revenue for us because we would, we would continue to dip our toe in there. It's like, all right, it's maybe time to launch a new product. We would do it, but we could have been much more aggressive. So that is my main mistake um, and failure that I would want to communicate to everybody. If you've already found a very successful like sales channel, in a way that you're, you know, bringing in revenue to the business, like double down on that. Because at the end of the day, everybody talks about this platform risk, right? If you really genuinely think about it, there's platform risk wherever you go, right? Because if you're running a Shopify site and you're getting all of your traffic from, let's say, Facebook or Instagram ads, well, guess who, guess where your platform, you know, dependency is now? You're 100% dependent on Facebook and Instagram continuing to work with you forever and ever, right? 
And we know that Facebook had its own challenges with the iOS update a couple of years ago. Um, and so whatever business you're running, there's always going to be platform risk, period. That, that's it. Like you can't do this on your own unless you just have a brick and mortar shop. And anyways, that's a whole other separate co- topic of conversation. So if you found something that's working, double down on it and keep getting squeezing all the juice that you can out of it. And guess what? If something does happen down the road, as an entrepreneur, you're probably creative enough to go pivot and go find the next sales channel or go find the next stream of uh, you know, leads that are going to come into your business. So recommendation is just like double down on what's working and don't think that you have to diversify and go create something from scratch. So when you say double down, what would that have looked like for you uh, rather than you know doing all this other work and all these other places? What would doubling down have looked like for you with regard to Amazon? Yeah, that's a great question. So doubling down on Amazon for us at that time would have meant not creating a Shopify site, not worrying about a blog, not worrying about adding this extra revenue stream of digital products that we thought was amazing, right? It would have been just focusing on Amazon, making our content on Amazon the best. Because to be honest with you, when we launched on Amazon, it was just a bunch of like, you know, Photoshop product images that now I look back on and my wife and I cringe. We're like, ooh, okay. I'm surprised they sold as well as they did because those listings themselves were not very impressive. But what's funny is like, we spent countless hours working on perfecting our website. The design was perfect. We had taken like professional lifestyle photos of like our family and different products. And it's like, we did all of that for the wrong sales channel. Like I'm sure our conversions would have been better on Amazon had we actually put time into those listings to make them look better, number one. And then number two would have been continuing to launch new products on Amazon. So keep finding new ideas, keep creating new products and keep launching on Amazon. That's been the the story of our success is like product launch after product launch after product launch. And we continue to find niches that uh, we can be successful in. And so that's what I would go back and do uh, is double down on Amazon by finding new products, creating those new products, and then actually perfecting those listings, making them the best that they could possibly be. So I think a lot of people kind of think like, you know, content marketing or blogging is going to be valuable for you. Uh, are you saying that it's not, or are you just saying that in your case, you were already successful on Amazon, no need to do all this extra work to start something else, but blogging could still be a good thing. Yeah. I I definitely think like content marketing definitely has a play, right? If you can send external traffic to Amazon, I mean, Amazon's loving that right now. And your organic ranking will shoot through the roof if you're continuing to feed the Amazon beast from external traffic. So is it a good idea? Yes. But as I looked at my core set of strengths and abilities, like I have never created a blog in my life, right? And we don't have, I'm not a copywriter. My wife's not a copywriter. Like, so we we didn't necessarily have somebody on the team that was going to be this like copywriter for us. So this is this massive undertaking for us. If I really wanted to go back. And so right now, if I wanted to create a content site for hat for our business, then what I would do is I would go acquire somebody else. I would go acquire a blog. I would go acquire a media. Like if I wanted a big Facebook group, that's my target market. I would go acquire that rather than spending countless time and hours um, invested in trying to figure this out from scratch. You can much more efficiently go acquire somebody, bring that into your business and just keep doing what you're really good at. Um, That flywheel spins a lot faster. And I want our guests to go back. Um, I interviewed Roland Frazier on our podcast and he talked a lot about acquiring content sites. I mean, he, he ran the gamut of acquiring businesses. So if you're looking for advice on acquiring businesses, I would definitely go listen to Roland Frazier's episode. Yeah, another mistake that you mentioned that you made was um, you felt like you, you, you hired people, but you didn't give them clearly defined roles. Kind of take me back and tell me what that looked like at the time. Yeah. So again, it's, it's the whole mistake that we made with trying to diversify our income, right? So this was 2019. Okay. And in 2019, we had, we were working with a business coach um, and she was like, yeah, if you guys want to run faster, like you, you should probably, if you want to grow more, you should go hire people. Well, here's the mistake. Just saying you should go hire people is not necessarily the right answer. You need to clearly know who 
should I hire? Why should I hire them? And how is this going to free up my time so that I can go do more revenue generating activities? Okay. So instead, what we did is we just hired on a bunch of expenses to ourselves. And we'll talk about what those were. Um, but we didn't have like clearly defined roles that said, this is what needs to happen. These, this is your day-to-day responsibilities. And this is what success looks like for you in your role. So instead, what we did is we obviously needed help finding external traffic to grow our Shopify site, right? So what I did is I tried to hire away this problem that we had. And so we paid close to six-figure salary for somebody to come in that was our marketing manager. And ideas were just bouncing all over the place and nothing was ever like really sticking. It's like, hey, we want to grow our revenue here on Shopify. And anything that we really tested out, like nothing really got the ball rolling there. And so we ended up letting that marketing manager go, you know, less than a year. I think she had been around for nine months, no fault of her own. I think she was a smart and capable person. But me as a business leader, like I made the mistake. I hired the wrong person, not, not that she was the wrong person, but I hired the wrong person for our business. We didn't need a marketing manager at that time. What we needed was more of like a, a project manager, right? That would have freed up my time instead of me having to go and think of all these marketing ideas. Like I could have somebody running the day-to-day operations of the business at the time, which would have freed me up to go find more revenue generating opportunities. The other thing we did is we hired two graphic designers. And again, why did we hire two graphic designers? Well, because we had to build up our Shopify site. We didn't need the graphic designers for our Amazon business. We said, we need more hands. We're not generating enough sales on our Shopify site because we don't have a big enough selection. So let's go get more. Let's add thousands and thousands of product designs. So here again, we just invested, you know, uh, it was more than six figures for when you combine both of those salaries together for those graphic designers. And really quickly, it was within three to six months, I realized like, whoa, 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 like, what are we doing? We're, we're investing all of this money into a side of our business that's not sustaining itself, right? Like, why are we siphoning off our money that we're making from Amazon and then throwing it away basically at this other business that's not going anywhere after three years of, of work and effort, right? Um, so those, those were a couple of my mistakes. So to the audience, what I would say is like, before you hire somebody, the biggest mistake is like so many people just say, hey, I need to go, marketing is my issue. I don't understand marketing, so I'm just going to go hire it out. That's a mistake. Because if you're just hiring something out because you genuinely don't know anything about it, number one, you're probably going to end up with the wrong person that you bring on your team. But number two, like you need to clearly identify what success looks like in that role. So if you're not familiar with finance or marketing or whatever it is that you're hiring out for, then go learn about it. First, get your hands dirty so that you know enough so that you can hire the right person and then be able to, you know, go work on extra, you know, revenue generating opportunities for your business. So that that were was one of my biggest takeaways there from those hiring experiences. Sure. Do you think you could have known? I mean, looking back, you know, hindsight is always 2020. Do you think looking back on it that you could have known that that was the the course you should, the route you should have taken rather than the one you did? Yeah. I mean, as I look back, I definitely know that. Right. But even if I were to go back to my younger self, right. In that 2019, it would, it's kind of a combination with that earlier mistake that I talked about in terms of diversifying. We're not a venture-backed um, company. So if you have a venture-backed company, sure, you can go hire out a full team, right? And be like, well, we're not making enough money today, but maybe five years from now, it's going to be worth it. It's like, we're not revenue back or we're not VC back. So why are we investing money, six plus figures, you know, up to $200,000 in overhead for a business that's not even coming close to generating, you know, like $20,000 a year. So it, it's just coming, like coming to that realization. And you, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that, that, uh, that. That's basically it. Just coming to that realization. They weren't, they weren't helping grow the business. Sure. Sure. You mentioned that you, uh, maybe you wished you had hired a operations director rather than a marketing director. And a large part of operations is kind of having processes 
and and uh, systems documented and in, in place. You said one of your big mistakes was waiting too long to document those things, processes and systems. Can you um, expound on that a little bit? Yep. Yeah. And all of these, I think, mistakes and failures, just like they add on to one another and you'll see kind of the a whole thought pattern of how all of this played out. But yeah, waiting too long to document processes. So, hey, I'm willing. And again, this is that whole period, 2017, 2018, 2019. Hey, I'm willing to go invest and hire people to go help this failing side of our business that we thought was going to be revolutionary. But yet I'm not going to hire anybody for the business that's actually producing us revenue, right? Like that, that's the mistake in and of itself. Instead, my mind of my train of thought was my wife and I have got it handled. We have one, um, my sister was actually helping us out. We've got an extra team member. We have extra pair of hands. They're helping out. Um, you know, we don't need to add any more overhead to our Amazon side of the business. We like, let, let's keep that very, very profitable. So uh, obviously you can see the mistake and flaw in that, that logic from the onset. So what I did is I just kept everything to myself rather than trying to like document the processes of ways that I was finding new products, the ways that we launched the products on Amazon, the ways that we did the keyword research for our products on Amazon. I did all of that myself because I was too scared to add an extra cost to that side of the business because I wanted to keep it profitable, which is just such a mistake in and of itself, right? And so I just held on to things way longer than I needed to. If I were to go back in at 2019, the first hire that should have been made would have been a project manager for me to then document the processes to say, this is how we find new products. This is how we do the keyword research. This is how we launch products. This is how we do our advertising. I need somebody to coordinate all of these moving parts, right? And instead, I kept being the one trying to juggle all the balls in the air. And again, I think we could have grown so much faster had I freed myself of those, you know, day-to-day operation operational tasks. I could have been thinking of new product ideas. I could have even been partnering with other influencers to drive traffic to our Amazon site. Uh, there's so much that I could have been doing that could have grown the business further on the Amazon side that I just held on to things way too long. I was too scared to hire nobody and also thought, well, this is this is like rocket science. Like there's no way nobody's going to be able to figure out like how to find a product on Amazon because I'm just so good at it. Nobody else can figure out Amazon PPC because I'm just so good at it, right? Like again, I'm I'm not the smartest person out there, right? And so those were just some mindset shifts that I really had to cross. I wish I could tell my younger self that, hey, like find somebody that can do it 80, 85, 90% as good as you are. That's going to be good enough. Are your processes and systems documented now? Yeah, they most certainly are. So the biggest change happened in 2020, right? So this is like, I would say like the most pivotal tipping point in our business was 2020. That's because COVID hit us, right? When COVID hit us, you know, we were doing a thousand plus orders a day on Amazon. Okay. COVID happens and the world starts shutting down. Overnight, our business went from doing over a thousand orders a day down to we were lucky to get like a hundred orders a day on Amazon itself. So, like, we experienced like a 90% drop overnight. So, it allowed us to obviously level set. That's when we said, all right, we're done with this. Shopify site. It's not doing anything for us. We were, you know, we had to lay off the person that we had running our blog for us because again, it wasn't revenue generating our marketing manager. All of this was like, okay, now we see a little bit more clearly now. Let's trim off this fat that we had added onto ourselves. And then we scaled back. And then it was just my wife and I and a couple other assistants. And then we said, all right, what do we do moving forward? Right. And so the first thing that I knew I needed to do is like, hey, if we're going to double down on Amazon now, right, because the world shut down, like, let's let's start building out more products. We're not going to launch them yet because the world's not ready for that. But that's when I started to realize, hey, the person I should have been hiring is this operations person that can start coordinating all of that. So at the end of 2020, that's when I started diligently documenting all of the processes. that I was doing. I went through, and this was very time intensive. I think it took me about three months, but I 
diligently went through recorded training videos and also um, typed stuff up in a Word doc and laid out, here are the steps that I'm taking. Here's the training that I've watched in the past to go find new products. And then I went and hired somebody to go execute just that specific area of the business, finding new products. And what they ended up doing was even perfecting my process even better, sharing better ideas. And I was like, oh, that's wicked smart. Like, yeah, let's add that to our process. So again, here I am holding on to all these processes thinking I'm the only one who can do it. It's like, I didn't know what I didn't know. And hiring somebody with a, you know, coming from a different point of view is able to point out some gaps in my logic and actually make it improve that process. So I was able to do that. We hired a project manager and then I went through and documented, here's how we go from an idea all the way to product launch. There's a lot of moving parts in our business, but this is how we do it. And let's start coordinating the different team members that can do that. So yes, today I would argue like nearly, I would say 90% of our processes that we have in our business are documented. They're on a training platform, like a video platform that like whenever we onboard new team members, they go in and they're able to watch kind of like a college course in a way, training videos that walk them through step-by-step what their role is, what they need to be doing. And then each time somebody is hired in that role, they always add to those processes and we update training videos. And so it's kind of the snowball effect where our processes are getting better and better and more efficient as time goes by. You, you mentioned that you felt when you, when you started, you felt like you had to hire people at the cheapest rate possible. I think that's, I think that's pretty common. You know, you, I've seen job postings where it's a new business and they're like, we're just taking unpaid interns for now, but you'll get a lot of great experience. Tell me about your thought process regarding um, hiring people and how much they should be paid and, and uh, why and what that looked like. Yeah, that, that's such a great question. And obviously it's very, you know, context specific. Every business is probably at a different point, but let me share with you kind of where we were at in our business, you know, the revenue and what we were doing and some of the hires that we were trying to make it at different rates. So back in 2019 is when we really wanted to try to like build out our team. Like I mentioned, we had hired all these, you know, staff members from the US and then we also wanted to go hire some more virtual assistants, right? From like the Philippines. Now we were doing, so in 2019, I think we did close to $6 million in revenue on Amazon. Okay. So we were doing well and we could certainly afford to, you know, we had honestly up until 2019, then my wife and I and my sister as our assistant, like up until 2019, so we had made it a long way, like a couple of years on Amazon, at least. Like I mentioned, 2017, we hit a million dollars on Amazon. 2018 was, I think, 3.5. And then 2019 was 6 million. Okay. That entire journey, we did that on our own. So one thing I would say to our audience that's listening, if you're just crossing that seven figure mark, or if you're still in that six figure mark, like you probably still need to put in a little bit more sweat equity, right? Everybody wants to go to that next level tomorrow, but sometimes it's really good to just like keep pushing and doing what you know you need to do. Let it grow a little bit bigger, document your processes along the way, and then make one hire at a time that can unlock more time for you. Okay. So if you are starting at that six, seven, you know, low seven figure number, obviously cost is a big, you know, portion of who you're going to hire. So many people out there tout, hey, I got a Filipino VA for three bucks an hour. I got them for four bucks an hour. And I kind of like laugh at that now because after going through and I have genuinely, I think we've had over probably at this point, 10,000 different Filipinos apply to our different positions that we've hired for over the last five years. And when I first started out, I was like, oh yeah, I got to find somebody that's in that three to $4 range. And, you know, the type of talent that's at that three to $4 range, that's, there's a reason why they're, they're charging the rates that they're charging. Right. But if you can, you know, even getting up to like that six, $7 range, you're going to get even better, more experienced individuals. Now there are some hidden gems that you can find when we, um, when we initially um, hired a few VAs from the Philippines, 
we hired probably like two or three that very quickly within like a couple months didn't work out. And they were at the lower end of that pay range, obviously. But we did stumble upon a couple that we still use to date that are great, that have been excellent VAs for our business. But we had to do 10 times the amount of interviews and work to end up weeding out and and finding those, those two that have been able to stick around. So in 2020, when we got a little more serious with like, hey, all right, we know that we need more like experienced talent on our team. That's when I was like, hey, maybe we should start looking at the $10 and above range. Right. And, and again, this is specific to the Filipinos um, and hiring there in the Philippines. That's where we've hired the majority of our team. And I believe it's a fantastic place, especially for a young business to go and acquire smart talent at very low cost rate. So I would definitely recommend before anybody goes and hires you know, people here in the U S and does a whole W two salary and all of that type of stuff. Like you're signing yourself up for a lot when you do that. But when you're working with a contractor overseas, you know what, you can test it out. If it doesn't work it within a month. Okay. On to the next one. It's a very low barrier to entry and it's, you know, very low risk, so to speak. So, um, going back to that story though, of, you know, who we needed to hire when we needed to hire a project manager, and somebody that could do the research and development, I knew that these were more specialized roles. And so we did have to increase the, you know, the the pay rate that we were offering. And through that, we found some amazing talent. The project manager that we found um, previously worked for IBM there in the Philippines. So her training and she's PMP certified, like she is just as good as any US based project manager. She has the same certification. She worked for a US based company, but yet her rate was about a fourth of what it would be here in the US. Right. And then our other uh, team member that we had for research and development, he was also working for a US based firm there in the Philippines. And they were trying to court him to actually move to the US um, at that time. And we were able to pick him up. And he, he's been a very, very good hire for us. But none of those, those, um, I guess, team members were cheap. Uh, you know, when you compare it to somebody that's arguing, oh, I found a $3 VA over in the Philippines. It's like, well, yeah, that's, that's great for you. I hope they're working out well. But when you go through the process and, and you actually look at somebody's experience, what they have to offer, their background, um, sometimes it's definitely, uh, it's, it's better to hire those more experienced individuals. How common have you found like cross-cultural barriers to be? Uh, when, you know, when kind of hiring out in the Philippines and things like that, places like that? Yeah. So honestly, um, I haven't found many issues with the the cultural aspect of hiring people in the Philippines. And the reason for that is because many of the team members that we've hired, they've previously worked for US-based companies. So they are very acclimated to the way things work in the US. I know the time zone is very different, obviously. Um, it's about 13 hours. There are 13 hours ahead right now. And so they're working, you know, their daytime is our nighttime and vice versa. But many of those team members, like I mentioned, they've been working for BPOs is what they call them there in the Philippines. And that's where they work for these large, you know, multinational firms like IBM, um, Procter and Gamble, Coca-Cola, all of those guys. And we were able to, you know, approach them and see that, hey, like the way they speak, the way they communicate is just as the same or very similar to the way somebody in the US would be able to communicate to us. The final mistake that you kind of highlighted when we first started was that you uh, you weren't, you you don't feel like you were as unique or original as you wished you would have been. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So this goes back to like when we first started launching products on Amazon itself. And so At the time, again, we were just testing different stuff out. And I believe that everybody goes through a period of like learning and growth on Amazon. But any recommendation I would give to anybody that's considering launching new products, whether they're on Amazon or anywhere else, what we did was we just looked at, hey, what's the best seller on Amazon doing? What does their product look like? And obviously, if if their product's successful, let's just go create another one that looks just like it and launch it on Amazon. Well, if you do that, then guess what happens? It's just a race to the bottom. 
whoever can price it out the cheapest, let alone the fact that if you go and copy somebody else, you can run into copyright issues, design pan issues, utility pan issues, obviously. And so number one, it's not a good, you know, it's not a great place to start from for those illegal reasons to begin with. But then number two, like you're dipping your toe in this kind of like saturated market where you're going to go compete with somebody now that already has thousands of reviews and you haven't really made your product offering that much more unique or differentiated. And so that's one of the things that and we're, I would say, argue like we're one of the best when it comes to finding unique designs now. Um, that's one of our greatest strengths for our business. That was a realization that that took place fairly early on. I think it was probably like, I think the second or third product that we launched, like we literally like, we changed up some of the words, but like, it was a very similar, like me too product. And I was like, why is this not being successful? And then I, it was honestly my wife that's like, hey, I think I could design something better. Like you just told me to create this, but I think I could actually make it better. And so that's what we ended up doing is, going and recreating something entirely different and new. And then, bam, we have success. We start beating out that, that top seller in that category. And it's like, okay, that's it. Like why we wasted, you know, a few thousand dollars investing in inventory, but it was a good lesson learned that is like, okay, we're going to go compete and get into a new market, so to speak. We've got to go create something that's unique, original. And there's so many different things that you can tap into in terms of inspiration for creative ideas. I would definitely go look at Pinterest. I would definitely go look at um, Etsy. I would go look at other sales channels and see what is doing well in some of those other sh sales channels, even Google Shopping, right? And then you can take bits and pieces from all of those different sales channels and kind of create your own based off of the inspiration that you got from lots of other you know, sellers or similar type of products. Um, that can add a lot of inspiration. So it's as simple as that. Don't go copy somebody else's work. Number one, that's that's not cool. But then number two, go and go and take the time to create something unique. You're you'll be able to know if you hit it, hit the nail on the head real quickly. But it's iteration after iteration, and that's where a real business is built. Did you did you or your wife know at the time that you could have come up with better ideas even before, and you were just doing it? because you thought it was a good business idea to kind of join the crowd? Or did you realize, did she kind of realize later, like, I, I can do better than this? Yeah, it, it was definitely the latter. Um, and I think that's because she was just kind of relying on me, you know, to say, hey, I found this product idea. And we were brand new to Amazon, right? Like prior to that, my wife and I were running a, our custom wedding invitation business. So my wife was still working with a lot of like custom wedding clients, or custom wedding invitation clients at the time. And so honestly, like we were just exploring Amazon, dipping our toes in the water. And she was just relying on me to like, hey, what, what do you need? I'm willing to support this initiative. Let's see if it goes anywhere. And it wasn't until like, I was like, ah, like, oh, th this is really struggling. Like, I don't know what success here. My wife's like, well, it's, it, to be honest with you, it's, it's pretty ugly. I, I just did what you told me to do because that's what you told me to do. She's like, but I think we could make it look a lot cuter. And I like that you kind of mentioned like joining the crowd, right? It's not that we intentionally copied like the best seller, like everybody in that category looked the exact same. Like there were tens, 20 like different competitors that all looked nearly identical, right? So that's the mistake in of us ourselves. Like we should have been like, why do we want to join the 20, right? Why do we want to look just like the other 20 do? And instead, you know, come out with something that's completely different, looks original, and then we're the one. And that's where all the eyeballs went after would, that. Would you say it's scary to kind of like, well, obviously uh, somebody has already thought of this before, so it must not be the, that successful. Is that why people don't do it or they just not realize that they can do better? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think it's definitely a combination of both. Um, we still debate that a uh, number of times in our business today, whenever we're going into new product categories, it's like, hey, is there a reason why a, a farmhouse design, for example, isn't in this, you know, children's bedroom area, right? Is there a reason for that? Or is that a gap in the market? So, you know, the thing that I have learned is that whatever I do think in my mind, if I think 
hey, this is going to crush it. This is a completely original design. This is a gap in the market. Typically, I'm proven exactly wrong. So what I think we've learned from that process, most importantly, is that you need to just create your minimum viable product, get it launched, and see what happens. Um, so working with a manufacturer, and this is maybe a, a secret tip or you know one that I would share with the audience, is when you're working with a manufacturer, try to get really low MOQs. And that's what's allowed us to like create thousands. You know, we have over uh, 1,300 SKUs right now. The only way we've been able to amass that, that high number of SKUs is the fact that like we're able to test things very cheaply. Like we're talking about like 25 unit orders just to test it out. And then it's like, oh, this was successful. Okay, now let's, let's go print a thousand of them now, right? And so that like just testing iterating and be like, well, I think this worked. This one was close, but maybe we could combine the two or whatever. So it's always being able to pivot, but testing stuff out, throwing it out to the market and seeing how they respond. So as we kind of wrap things up here, um, what, what's a, maybe a, a broad takeaway or a primary lesson that you'd like to have your listeners learn from these mistakes? You felt like you had to diversify your sales channels for your business. You, you hired people without clearly defined roles waited too long to document processes and systems. Uh, you felt like you had to hire people at the cheapest rate possible. And then um, you weren't particularly unique and original um, with some of your offerings when you started. Maybe what's, a, what's kind of a big takeaway that people should, should have? Yep, I'll, I'll kind of sum it up into like the way I think the ideal process should have looked like for our business going back in time, right? So when we initially found success on Amazon, we should have doubled down on Amazon. And we should have just said, hey, all right, if we're going to invest in resources for Amazon or for our team, it's going to serve our Amazon marketplace where we are finding great success right now. Then that leads into not being scared to go and actually hire people to support something that is making you money, right? I think you should never be scared to go hire for a particular role if that particular role that you're going to hire for is to support further growth in that channel right? So document your processes and then go hire out that role. And while you're at it, don't be scared or think that I have to go get the dirt, a dirt cheap rate. Go, go maybe spend a little bit more. If your budget is like three bucks an hour, I would argue, you know, you should go try and double that, right? Go to $6 an hour. Go see what candidates you can find there. Offload your processes to them. Let them go and refine your processes and improve them, in fact. And then, then as your business continues to grow, then you can go get more experienced individuals, right? You could go get people that cost even more money. And I believe that that's kind of the nature of the way business works, right? The team that got you here is probably not going to be the team that gets you there, right? A team that gets you from you know, maybe six to seven figures, probably not the same type of talent that you need to go from seven to eight. And then if you want to go from eight to nine figures, you're going to need a whole new team with a different set of capabilities because they're going to be different challenges that the team that got you from, let's say, seven to eight has no experience with. So that would be kind of like my summation of like going back in time. That's the way the ideal process would work. I wish our business could have followed that process, but I hope you know our listeners are able to take away a, a few bits and pieces that they're able to apply into their own business to be able to overcome a lot of those kind of, I don't know, easy mistakes or silly mistakes that I made along the way. Absolutely. Hey, Josh, it's been great talking to you. Great information, great insight. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Chad. So long, everybody. Thank you for listening. Visit ecombreakthrough.com for more information. If you've enjoyed today's episode, the best way you can show your appreciation is by clicking the subscribe button and quickly leaving a review. See you again next time.